Welcome friends to this third lecture of uh, week 11 of uh, soil sensing technology and in this lecture we will be finishing off first the geostatistics and then we will be starting the new uh, uh, sensor that is diffuse deflectance spectroscopy. So, in the last lecture we stopped here about the you know uh, in this in this slide while talking about the spatial prediction model and remember that the spatial prediction is a process of estimating the value or in terms of quantitative value properties at unvisited site within the area covered by existing observation. So, if you see here this is our area of interest and this area of interest or in our study area this is an obviously this scheme in the horizontal space. So, obviously there are some observation here like you know denoted by Z s 1, Z s 2 and Z s n and we want an observe we, we want to predict our value at this unobserved point that is Z s 0. Similarly, for a target variable in a one directional space you can see here as the target is you know variable distance uh, you know increases from a particular point how this variation changes and we want to predict a value here. So, uh, we need to consider all these uh, observed points while, while, while we are going to predict that uh, particular points. So, let us see how it does that, how, how we generally do that. So, let us go ahead and see um, a target variable z can be denoted at z s i z s 2 and up to z s n where s i is basically x i y i. Uh, which is a location and x i i are the coordinates like primary locations. So, a in our case this is the total area though this is a is our the total geographical domain of interest or, or in other words it is a study area. So, assuming that the samples are representative unbiased and consistent then values of the target variable at some new location s 0 for example, here can be derived using a special prediction model and it defines both inputs, outputs and the computational procedure to derive outputs based on the given inputs. Now, you can see this is the formula through which we can derive you know we can we can define this model where uh, s 0 is an un, you know z cap s 0 is, is the value at that unobserved point or un, uh, of unobserved point that is s 0 and obviously, this z s i is the input point data set whereas, the q k s 0 is the list of deterministic predictors and this uh, gamma h is basically covariance uh, model defining the special autocorrelation structure. Now, what is special autocorrelation? We will see that later on. So, geostatistical modeling, let us talk about geostatistical modeling. Geostatistical modeling has the premise that one cannot obtain error free estimates of unknown. So, we have to field find a, or find a deterministic model. So, there is no possibility to find a deterministic model and uh, thus our approach would be to use statistical method to reduce the estimate of the error uh, of estimating unknowns. So, must be a probabilistic model. So, you can see estimation of error here we need to develop a good estimate of unknown say we have a 3 estimates of an unknown one to estimate the unknown t cap 0. So, obviously, it has to be done by this variance measurement. So, it is basically this uh, sigma 0 square is the mean square error. So, similarly, if we go ahead and see the estimation of the error that in estimator that minimizes the mean square error of variance that is uh, mean square error obviously that is in variance is called the best estimator. So, this is very very important term the best estimator or the best another you know again the best estimator is the the estimator that minimizes the mean squared error of or in other words variance. So, when the expected error is 0 then the estimator is called unbiased obviously and note the variance can be written more generally as this format where is the lamb you know summation of lambda i t i for points 1 to n where n is the number of measurements and this lambda i lambda 2 up to lambda n are coefficients or weights. So, such an estimator is called the linear estimator because we are linearly uh, producing we are linearly expressing this uh, uh, you know uh, linearly expressing this value. So, so the variance can be more generally you know expressed as a you know is a uh, is a summation of this uh, you know individual weights and uh, So, 
so that's why it is called blue so blue is basically a short form of best linear unbiased estimator so uh, you know blue stands for b stands for which minimizes the variance and l stands for which can be expressed as the terms as the sum of factors and u stands for unbiased that is expects a zero error so it is called a blue estimator so similarly uh, we will see that Kriging which is an important geostatistical interpolation is a blue estimator. So, let us see what are the different types of special prediction model. So, there are two different types of special product categories of special prediction model. One is called the mechanical model or empirical models another is statistical model or probabilistic model. Now, in the mechanical model there are several types of mechanical models one is Thyssen polygon then inverse distance interpolation then regression on coordinates spline so on so forth. And also in the statistical or probabilistic model you can see Kriging which is a plain geostatistics second environmental correlation which is basically regression based and then Bayesian based models and finally mixed model which is regression Kriging. We will talk about regression Kriging later on while we will be discussing uh, you know digital soil mapping. So, you see there are two types of models. So, what is the difference between this mechanistic mechanical model as well as the statistical model. Remember that these mechanical models are you know arbitrary or empirical model parameters you know this model this mean this mechanical model we generally use arbitrary or empirical model parameters and no estimate of the model error is available and usually no strict assumption about the variability of a feature exists. So, these are the features of uh, mechanical model. However, in case of statistical or probabilistic model you see that the model parameters are commonly estimated in an objective way following the probability theory and the predictors are accompanied by uh, you know with the estimate of the prediction error. So, you will see not only the prediction, but also you will see side by side their uh, you know estimate of their error. So, obviously, there are some drawbacks. Drawbacks is input data set usually need to satisfy strict statistical assumptions. So, this is the drawback of this probabilistic model. So, let us see one example for each. So, inverse distance interpolation which is an important mechanistic model or mechanical model for interpolation. So, you see uh, in the inverse distance interpolations in short form we call it IDI or we sometimes call it IDW also. So, a value of target variable at some new location can be derived as a weighted average. So, you can see just like we have shown that then estimator can be you know variance can be shown as a you know as a as a summation of individual weights and the points just like lambda i t i if you remember in the last couple of slides we have talked about. So, similarly a value of a target variable at some new location here can be expressed as an weighted average. So, here lambda is the weight for the neighbor i and the sum of weights needs to be equal to uh, 1 should be equal to 1 to ensure an unbiased estimator. So, it should be equal to 1 you would remember that and matrix form is obviously this is the matrix form there is a simplest approach for determining the weight is to use the inverse distances from all points to a new point. So, you see we have uh, we, we can assign any value at a particular point based on its nearby neighboring points. However, we have to assign some particular values of weight to these individual neighboring points. So, the simplest approach for determining the weight is to use the inverse distance from the all points to the new point. That means, those points which are close to the unobserved points or the point of interest will have better or higher weights than that of the points which are more farther away from the point of uh, interest. So, you can see here the lambda i s 0 you can be it can be calculated by 1 by uh, d beta s 0 s i and by dividing by this term where beta equal to greater than 1 uh, beta greater than 1 where d s 0 and s i which is this is d s 0 s i is the distance from the new point of a of a known sample point and beta is the coefficient that is used to adjust the weights. So, this way points which are close to an output pixel will obtain large weights as I have talked about and the points which are farther away. 
so for example if this is a particular point so the points which are close by will have better weight that that of the points which are having uh, which which are located far away from the this point so so in that way the uh, you know uh, large weights and um, you know the you know the points which are close to output pixel will obtain large weights and that points which are further away from an output pixel will obtain small weights so the higher the better the less importance will be put into that put on distant points so the remaining problem is to how to estimate beta objectively so that it reflects the inherent pro properties of a data set now the problem is the objectively you know the the major problem for idw is to cal calculate this beta objectively we cannot do that in in the, you know in this inverse distance interpolation that is the major problem of inverse distance interpolation although beta gives us the relative distribution of weightage uh, for the points which are nearby to this uh, point of interest or output pixel as compared to those points which are farther away from the output pixel however there is no objective way to determine this beta so this is what we call inverse distance interpolation now what is kriging kriging is another name is geostatistical interpolation and this is more scientific and you can say it is a sophistication of idw or idi so it originated in the mining industry in the early 1950s as a measure of improving one you know ore reserve estimation as you can see this is a kriging map i have produced here so a standard version of kriging is called ordinary kriging obviously there are several types of kriging you see universal kriging indicator kriging co kriging you see several types of kriging and then regression kriging however this is a uh, you know we will we'll be talking about only the simplest ordinary kriging so a standard version of kriging can be a term is ordinary kriging and this ordinary kriging can be represented here i uh, have this an uh, value of an uh, you know of, of a pixel can be represented as a combination of a mu and this e dash s so basically mu represents the constant stationary function or global mean where mu you know e dash is basically spatially correlated stochastic part of the variation or in other words this ordinary kriging can take this mathematical formula where again you can see this is taking this summation of lambda i ti which we have seen previously so it is basically also we can see it in case of idi so here lambda 0 is basically vector of kriging weights or wi and z is basically vector of n observation at primary locations and in a way kriging can be seen as a sophistication of the inverse distance interpolations so uh, obviously why it is called sophistication of inverse distance interpolation because of this feature called variogram because you remember in case of inverse distance interpolation we calculated beta for assigning the weights but there was no objective way to calculate the beta however these weights in the kriging interpolation can be calculated objectively by using a using a specific model we call it variogram now in the variogram in the problem of idi i used to determine how much importance should be given to each neighboring points we cannot assign that we we didn't know that so variogram can you know variogram can solve that problem so variogram can be expressed is a difference between the neighboring values so here h is basically lag or in the x axis if we have the distance between the point pairs and in the y axis basically we are putting the variance so this variogram is basically a graph in a simple term it is basically a graph between the distance between the point pairs and the variance of the values between the point pairs so you can see the you know here this is the mathematical formula of a variogram or uh, you know uh, or the same of the variogram here uh, you know z si is basically the value of a target variable at some sample location where z si plus h is the value of neighbor at distance si plus h and using this formula n is the number of point pairs so using this formula using this formula we can see uh, you know how these variances uh, you know we, we, we by using this formula we can plot 
this uh, you know we can we can plot this graph and this is called semi variogram so basically what is the importance of this semi variogram or variogram it basically measures the variability of data with respect to spatial distribution specifically look at the variance between the pairs of data points over a range of separation scales or age so you can see here this is the variation you know this is the you know experimental variogram so basically in the in this graph it shows in the x axis the the distance and the y axis obviously uh, the obviously these are some data clouds and these are the data pairs so in the x axis we are putting the distance and the y axis we are putting the semi vario semi variance now we know how to calculate the semi variance we have just seen in the last slide and then we are fitting a we are fitting a line by least square method and this is called the experiment you know empirical semi variogram and this basically shows spatial autocorrelation effect now what is spatial autocorrelation this is very important now you see here as the distance between the point pairs increases in the x axis the semi variance is continuously increasing up to a certain point and then it is getting uh, you know it, it is reaching a plateau so you see up to this point for example up to this point it, the semi variance is increasing so up to this point the there is a special dependence between the points in other words you will see that uh, you know the nearby points are more specially correlated than those points which are farther away and this relationship is called the special dependence or special autocorrelation and this special autocorrelation structure can be captured by using a variation using a variogram okay so there are several other terms we'll see that later on so a variogram this is a variogram or semi variogram function you can see how the semi variogram or variance we have cal calculated i have shown you the uh, i have already shown you the the formula now you see in the x axis is basically we call lag or separation distance we generally term we generally express this in terms of h so you see that as the separation distance of point pairs increases this semi variogram or semi variance increases up to certain point and then it reaches a plateau so that means and this uh, you know it, it does not starts from an origin it starts from certain points and this distance is called the nugget and this nugget is basically denotes this nugget basically denotes the pure noise or measurement error and the total variance or maximum variance is called the seal. So, this is called nugget which is the basically uh, you know the measurement error or pure noise which you cannot measure and this is the total variance or seal. So, this is the total variance of seal and the distance separate and separate distance separation distance at which these semi variograms take a flat shape is called the range. So, you see these are the model these are the experimental variogram and this is the model variogram. This model can take several forms like you know it can be spher spherical, it can be exponential, it can be circular, it can take bezel and all other forms and these are basically fitted based on least square estimates just like we fit. Uh, you know model uh, linear regression model using least square estimate. So, this is basically variogram. So, range is the maximum distance at which data are correlated. So, up to this maximum distance this data will be correlated after that data will be independent. Nugget is the distance over which data are absolutely correlated or unsample and then seal is the maximum variance of the data pairs. So, now I hope these terms are clear to you. Now, there are different types of variogram like you know sp linear, spherical, exponential, circular, Gaussian, Bessel, power and so on and so forth. You can see this is, a, you know, this is an exponential model of semi variogram and obviously this is fitted through, uh, uh, you know, through least square estimation. So, what are the assumptions of Kriging? Assumptions of Kriging says that the target variable is stationary that means right now we are measuring the stationary variable uh, for example we are if we measure the ph that is a stationary variable uh, that should not uh, you know and finally it has a normal distribution which is probably the biggest limitation so another uh, you know problem for kriging is that it assume the data comes from the normal uh, normal distribution so 
if the data is not normally distributed we have to make some transformations some logarithmic transformation to make it first normal and then we use that data for uh, you know Kriging interpolation so these are some drawbacks for Kriging these are some uh, you know for you know uh, relation of Kriging uh, you know Kriging uh, you know uh, these are some relation between the variogram and how these variance same variance and covariance uh, you know relate to each other so you can see here uh, this semi variance and covariance are showing the opposite trends as the semi variance is increasing along with the increasing distance of the data uh, data pairs or lag distance the covariance is decreasing obviously the covariance shows the how these two variables changes along with uh, you know how covariance is a measure of uh, variation between two uh, variables and it obviously decreases when the distance between these points are de increasing and this is again the nugget this is another uh, sale, uh, this is another uh, this is the nugget effect this c0 and c0 plus c1 is the seal and this is the practical range this is called the pure nugget effect that means we cannot see any seal remember that the higher the seal that means higher the special dependence However, here we are getting max, maximum amount of nugget effect, we are not getting the seal, so seal is very less as compared to nugget, so we are getting pure nugget effect, so no, no evidence of special autocorrelation we are getting here. This is an example of unbounded variogram, okay. so these are some important terms. There are several models for variograms, you can see spherical model, exponential model, circular model, Gaussian models and these are their uh, mathematical uh, functions and these are these are actually Kriging outputs. So, based on this model estimation, based on the special dependence which is modeled through this semi variogram or variogram, Kriging basically interpolates the value in some unsampled locations and you can see using different types of Kriging we are producing these uh, you know interpolated maps, this is universal Kriging map, this is an exponential Kriging map, this is circular Kriging map you can see here and these are three points. So, guys uh, we have finished this uh, geostatistics and let us move ahead and start a new topic that is the basic of diffuse reflectance spectroscopy. Now diffuse reflectance spectroscopy has become a very very uh, you know important tool nowadays in the hand of soil science and in the hand of soil scientist because nowadays uh, we are using this for extensive analysis of different soil features both the soil physical properties as well as soil. Uh, you know uh, chemical properties as well as uh, biological properties and uh, we will see that later on. Now why we require diffuse reflectance spectroscopy? Now you know that we use different types of uh, you know uh, standard methods in our laboratory for measurement of different soil properties starting from you know uh, you know for pH we use the pH meter, for EC we use the uh, EC meter, electrical conductivity, conductivity meter, for uh, measurement of organic carbon we use uh, standard Wackley black method, sometime we use the loss on ignition method also or in advanced cases we use this, uh, um, this CHNS analyzer. However, although these methods are very much accurate, uh, these are time consuming and then costly and also produces some caustic wastes to the environment. So, we require some alternative for uh, you know we require some alternative tools for measurement of these particular soil properties and diffuse reflectance spectroscopy is one of these tools which can offer cost effective rapid and non-destructive measurement of soil analysis or soil parameters. So, what are the advantages of this technique first of all? Uh, first of all it is very fast as you can see here, this technique is very very fast you can literally take a reading uh, you know you can take a you know you, you can literally take a scan of a soil sample using uh, only you know 5 to 10 seconds. So, you can see this is the diffuse reflectance spectrometer you can literally carry it in your backpack with a handheld probe and using this handheld probe you can take the reading at any desired points 
of the soil. Now, you see they have uh, isolated a core from the soil surface and uh, from the soil and they are just measuring using this handheld probe and these handheld probe will transmit the results into uh, through a Bluetooth to this uh, computer or uh, you know PDA and this PDA will store all the results here. So, what are the benefits of using this diffuse reflectance spectroscopy? First of all, this is fast, you can literally take the scan of a particular soil sample within 5 to 10 seconds. It is cost effective that means almost zero recurring cost, it runs through battery, so you require only the battery to charge and you can use it, you does not require any consumable, it does not require any other uh, you know caustic uh, chemicals and it is high throughput and non-invasive this is very important high throughput means you can literally take the scan of a soil sample and you can literally save a spectra of a particular sample and that spectra can be used for predicting soil properties or predicting a multiple soil properties so, from a single spectra you can predict a multiple of soil properties and that is why this is called high throughput and also it is called non-invasive because it is not destructing the soil, it can you, you can use this soil sample later on for some further analysis also. So, that is called non-invasive and you can see it is portable in nature. So, due to these all these things, all these uh, you know. Uh, plus points, we are now using this spectroscopic sensor or diffuse reflectance spectroscopic sensor extensively in the soil science discipline. And what are the parameters we can measure? These are some of the parameters we can measure like organic carbon, available nitrogen, phosphate, potassium, then for pH and clay and you know other sand silt and then moisture and heavy metals. So, you can see a range of parameters you can measure through this property, through this uh, you know diffuse reflectance spectrometer radiometer. And also remember that this diffuse reflectance spectroradiometer can also measure different microbiological properties, different biological properties, different physical properties of the soil also. So, why we call it visible to near infrared diffuse reflectance spectroscopy or in a short form we call it VIS NIR DRS. So, remember you I, I hope that you know what is the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, the electromagnetic spectrum basically consists of several regions starting from gamma ray, then x-ray, then ultraviolet, then visible infrared microwaves, radio waves and long waves. So, the gamma rays and x-rays are you know highly penetrating rays because they have high energy that means they have high frequency. However, as we go down we will see visible range which is varying from 400 to 700 nanometer and then we see the near infrared range which basically varies from 300 to 700 to 2500 nanometer roughly and after that there is a mid infrared and far infrared and all this so on and so forth. So, this visible and near infrared diffuse reflectance spectroscopy is a technique that uses mug light or contact probe to produce reflection at different wavelengths. So, basically what happens this instrument as you see in the uh, last slide. So, let me go back to the last slide so that it becomes you know more clear. So, if you go to the last slide. You see it is a handheld probe. So, this handheld probe has a light source, halogen light source and it has got and it is also connected uh, you know through a fiber optic cable to the detector which is presented inside this uh, inside this main spectroradiometer. So, this fiber optic cable uh, you know uh, this, uh, this uh, you know halogen light source basically shines a light or produce a white light and this light basically get reflected from soil surface and the reflection is basically detected in the 350 to 2500 nanometer range. Okay. So, that is why it is called visible to near infrared diffuse reflectance spectroscopy. Okay. So, basically it is called visible to near infrared diffuse reflectance spectroscopy because it can measure the reflections from 350 to 2500 nanometer range which roughly covers the visible and as well as the near infrared range. Okay. So, 
So, basically it covers from this visible to near infrared range. So, if we go ahead and see how this diffuse reflectance works. So, as you know that soil material has a rough surface and when there is a high white light hits the any, any material some amount is getting reflected and this re detected you know and this reflected radiation can be detected by these detectors which is present in this VZNIR DRS and it can detect from 350 to 2500 nanometers. So, that is why we are calling it VZNIR DRS. Now, the question comes why it is called diffuse reflectance you know there are two types of reflection generally occurs. First of all, the first of all it is called specular reflection, another is called diffuse reflection. Now, the specular reflection here generally occurs from a very plain surface like mirror surface or water surface. However, the diffuse reflection always occurs from very rough surface. Now, in the specular reflection always occurs when there is an you know the incident the angle of incidence is always equal to the angle of reflection. Whereas, in case of diffuse reflection since it is occurring from a rough surface like you know like any powder surface like soil the angle of incidence is not equal to the angle of reflection. So, this is the difference between uh, you know you know specular reflection and diffuse reflection remember that the, the specular reflection occurs from very uh, plain surface like water or mirror surface and in case of diffuse reflection it generally occurs from fine particle and powder and rough surfaces like soil and coal. So, guys let us stop here and we will continue from here we will continue from here and we will talk about uh, different applications and their basics of diffuse reflectance spectroscopy in the next uh, lecture and we will finish it uh, in the next lecture. Thank you very much.